from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm in Adelaide between test matches at the moment. And that's meant that I've had a chance to do a little bit of bush walking, do some wildlife spotting. It's actually part of the Hyson Trail, which is some stretch of 1,200 kilometres, goes all the way from the south coast of South Australia, all the way up into the Flinders Ranges. I only did a teeny, teeny bit of it up to the top of Mount Lofty Summit, which is on the outskirts of, of Adelaide City itself today. But plenty of wildlife, kangaroos, an echidna, Jim, that's basically like a, an Australian hedgehog, and even uh, a lizard which I think was a shingleback lizard, I learnt afterwards. A little bit slow moving, a bit like me in the morning sometimes, but very beautiful all the same. <laughs> well done, Ali. You're getting around the place. Um, I'm somewhere between test matches and Sydney going to Brisbane and hoping that um, South Africa turn up and play some strong cricket because, my goodness, we need it after two seriously one-sided test matches so far. But it's the pinnacle of the game. And we're expecting South Africa, who haven't lost a series here for some time, uh, to turn up and, and give Australia a challenge. I hope that happens. Hello, everybody. This is Charu Sharma. Uh, glad to be back on Stumped. I've just reached New Delhi and I'm at a friend's place, Vikram Yadav, who leads our cricket team. Because tomorrow we're going to play some alumni cricket once again uh, up north. This is a public school alumni tournament between Neo College, my uh, school, and the Doon School, uh, Sindhya, and Delhi. It's just like a you know, really fun event that I look forward to. And I'm actually skipping my Pro Kabaddi League final, which happens this weekend, to play this alumni tournament. I must be nuts. But it, it's great to be back on Stumped. And so much cricket going on, and therefore, so much to talk. About. We thought we would take the chance at the start of the program here to really have a bit of a dive into all those matches going on and ask ourselves, you know, who should be the most confident test team going into 2023 and maybe who out of those playing at the moment should be the most worried about the fortunes of their side. So, Jim, you and I have been watching Australia, uh, top of the test championship table. And they're about to take on South Africa, as you mentioned, for a three-match series. So off the back of the West Indies, this is really the main course of the summer, isn't it, now for Australian cricket? It is. It's interesting to look at those behind Australia in the rankings. Uh, South Africa, too. It's hard to believe it's Sri Lanka, a three. Uh, and then you would think uh, on any sort of form recently, that it would be India and England who'd be vying for the, the playoff against Australia. But it sounds like England have still got to do a, as much as, as, as India to make sure of, of getting there. So, um, yes, it, it's a bit like that, unfortunately. Um, it just doesn't seem to sink in with current form, that a run of uh, rankings down to England at, at five and Pakistan mm. six. Well, they've left it a little bit late, haven't they, to make any sort of, of charge. But almost, you know, Sri Lanka, the sort of surprise package of the year in many ways, Cherry, that they're sort of up at third in the table as they are? Well, they are very strong at home and they've been lucky to be playing a little bit at home. But yeah, it's surprising and, and equally surprising that India and England are where they are. Jim just mentioned, you mentioned uh, the, their spots. From whatever little I know, India need to win all six test matches that are uh, in store for them for uh, the, the next, you know, till the cycle comes to an end. So... That is not impossible, but it seems like a bit of a mm. tall order. And England are playing so well, Alison. And for them now to also be in a fair, I won't say impossible, but a very difficult situation, I wonder who eventually is going to meet Australia because Australia do seem to be at a point where you can't shake them off the top two spots. So that's one half done of the Test Championship. I feel very sorry for New Zealand after you know being mm. the defending champions and they're in an, an absolutely hopeless, impossible spot. Yeah, and uh, Kane Williamson has just stepped down as their test mm. captain as well. So Tim Southey taking over. There's another one for the Fast Bowlers Union, <laughs> captaining a test side. Mm. Although yeah. Kane will carry on, Williamson will carry on in the white ball format. But uh, yeah, that a development for, South Af for, for New Zealand cricket. And they've got England coming in February as well. So that's Brendan McCullum on his home soil course they've already uh, met since he took over uh, during the English summer but Jim I mean the the South Africa series I do want to talk to you about the Australia South Africa series coming up because there's going to be plenty of spice to that do you reckon that these two groups of players are going to really go in hard and aggressive do you think things have sort of toned down a little bit almost by necessity given the sandpaper gate tour that happened last time these teams met 
Well, in the shadow boxing that goes on prior to a series, the, the media, the, the press are all over. Uh, the Rabada Smith confrontation from 2018 and Usman Kawaja, of course, has been making a commentary about there's no one good enough to replace Warner no matter what he does. And with all this uh, sort of carry on, I suppose there, there will be some edginess in the series, particularly with this pace attack. Uh, that South Africa have got. It it looks very handy. I mean, if they can do what the West Indies never looked like doing and get through the top order, uh, this could be a very good series. The worry for South Africa uh, is their batting, whether or not it's good enough with the relentless pressure that Australia can apply, particularly in their own backyard, their pace attack and Nathan Lyon. uh, They're going to have to do a bit of Stokes and Basball, I think. They've got to take Australia on a bit. And um, therefore, yes, I'm sure it will be a bit spicy and that'll be good. That's what we want. Uh, You know, we're screaming for a contest. (laughs) We have one. (laughs) So let's just take a moment to talk about England in particular because they are down at fifth in the World Test Mm. Championship table behind Sri Lanka and India, as we've mentioned. But they have won eight of their last test matches, including a series win over Pakistan. Um, I mean... It is too late to charge for them, Chow, isn't it? But the difference in 12 months from when they were being beaten soundly in Australia is just staggering. It's a very strange flip-flop. I I don't see how and why they lost the matches they did about a year ago, but the kind of style they're playing now, the aggression, and of course the bowling, is just uh, top of the world. I mean, so the series in Pakistan, because it's happening so close to us, is something we've watched very closely. And uh, all I can say is uh, we've got to compliment Pakistan as well for staying with England almost all the way. They lost the second one very narrowly. And the first one too, despite all those millions of runs being scored, you know, Pakistan did come back. So it's been a very absorbing series. And somehow England, perhaps more because of their bowling really, rather than their batting, both sides have batted reasonably well, uh, have, uh, have really shown the world that even on these tracks, they can come up with these magic deliveries. So it's been a wonderful series. And, and I just wonder, we're talking about the t- World Test Championships, whether England has uh, an outside chance of making the final because they are playing, to my mind, the best cricket among all the countries in terms of red ball right now. They've got a nice little balance there at the moment. And uh, best I must be looking and thinking, well, how am I going to get into this team with this bloke <laughs> Harry Brook bashing it all over the ground? So it's very exciting. I think, and and at all points, uh, as any Australian will tell you, uh, to an Ashes series, uh, the like of which we may uh, have never have seen before in prospect. So uh, just put it this way, if Australia play anyone else but England in the final of that championship and happen to win it, uh, then it just adds a bit more momentum to the expectation for England in an Ashes series taking on the world champions. (laughs) I'm just trying to that in. Australia, after this three-test series against South Africa, embark on the small matter of a four-test match series in India in February and March. So how much of a challenge is is this going to be for Pat Cummins and his Australian side? Well, I do think quite massive. Uh, I mean, they are playing fabulous cricket, no doubt, but it's not easy to win in India for most teams. And I do think it's going to be a fabulous contest, uh, uh, as much as I suppose the Ashes in terms of quality. Uh, India are going through a bit of a rough patch right now in just about every department of the game, certainly not starting out well with the bat, which is a pity. They've lost a couple of their bowlers temporarily because of injuries. So I've got to admit that at this point of time, India seem a little more vulnerable, but they're always very strong at home, aren't they? And it depends on what kind of pitches and where they play. But uh, the India-Australia contests are now, uh, you might want to throw England into the mix, but these are this is the apex contest. And uh, when it happens in, in Australia and India win, it's fabulous when Australia come to India. If they should win, it'll be fabulous because uh, India, like most teams, are very, very strong at home. And yes, we look greatly forward to the contests. It's just that I st- maybe the India-Australia contest will get the crowds back. But in India, my belief is that test matches are, are just a notch lower than they were in terms of attention, say, even five years really? ago. So I hope that Australia, when they come in here and the media, amongst others, 
you know, throw the whole contest up and there's this churn that the crowds and the attention returns to test match cricket because, as you know, there's so much white ball cricket going on, so much attention there as well. Arjun Tendulkar is at the very start of his first-class career, but he scored a century on his first-class debut, the 23-year-old son, of course, of the legendary Sachin Tendulkar. So that was 100 yeah. playing for Goa in the Ranji Trophy. Charu, so, I mean, I imagine that got a fair amount of headlines, didn't it, in India? Well, it's like nobody else has got any runs at all except <laughs> for Arjun. No, good for him because, you know, I mean, imagine the cross that he's bearing. I mean, it's it's, a, it's ridiculous. But And I watched him before. There was a Mumbai T20 league and he's been sort of in the, on the periphery for quite a while. And which is why, of course, he shifted from Mumbai to Goa to get a better shot at uh, getting a few games. So it's fabulous. And I can't imagine how proud Sachin would be feeling right now. It's not a cheap team, by the way. I mean, he, he, scored, he got his 100 against Rajasthan, which is a pretty strong team, generally speaking. Uh, of course, everybody's forgotten that his uh, the, the guy he had a big partnership with, um, Prabhu Desai, got 200 on. But it's all about Arjun getting the 100, and I'm really happy for him because he's a nice guy. Of course, he's primarily a left-arm quickie. Uh, yeah. so the run getting is, is sort yeah. of almost, well, I'm not saying incidental. I'm sure you want to be called an all-rounder, but it's, it's like a massive monkey of his back, isn't it? And that's his debut match. It's taken time for him to play a Ranji Trophy match, but in a debut match, you get a hundred, you match your father. Oh, the celebrations in the Tendulkar home must be fabulous. Now, let's talk a bit of women's cricket because the Women's T20 World Cup starts in February and there are two series going on now which are attracting quite a lot of attention, not least India versus Australia and 47,000 fans flocked to Mumbai to see the second T20 international end with a super over. So never mind men's test cricket, not attracting crowd. The women are attracting very big numbers. And Australia being yep, the number one side in the world in women's cricket right now, they've just won 21 matches in a row. So it was always going to take something rather special to beat them. And so step up, India's Devika Vaidya, after eight years out of the T20 side as well for India. She hit a four off the last ball of the normal match in the 20 overs to level the scores and therefore send the game into a super over. And well, that crowd just seemed absolutely wild for it. Then we saw Risha Ghosh and player of the match, Smriti Mandana, smash sixes off Heather Graham, who was making a debut for Australia in that super over. They made 20 runs off the six balls. And in response, Australia only managed 16. And so there was the victory for India. But I mean, Charu, what a spectacle that was. I mean, Australia did come back to win the third match, but holding their nerve to beat the world number one team in this sort of pressure situation, is that going to bode well for this elusive World Cup trophy in February? Well, it's about time. I mean, India have been so close, the Indian women that is so close so long now, and it just hasn't happened for them. But uh, it, you could argue that there was home advantage. And of course, when that volume of crowd gets behind you in a near full stadium of the D.Y. Patel, which is on the outskirts of Mumbai, then, you know, what better in terms of motivation? It was an extraordinary match, no doubt about it. Got plenty of media here in uh, in India. It's been, I'm sure it's going to be replayed several times as well. But it was a pity, therefore, that they went down by a reasonably big margin at the uh, Brabant Stadium, the, the CCI, the, the next uh, the next match around. And you might notice that uh, even the, the, the number of uh, spectators was a lot less than the D.Y. Patel. I mean, India is trying to now opened the gates and women were allowed free and so on and so forth but still you have to make a lot of time uh, it's never easy getting around in India to actually go to the ground and watch so I do think the crowds were the most special part of course it's top opposition playing Australia any win uh, for any team over Australia any time is fantastic so if they can just somehow keep the rest of the series close or at least the matches close uh, I think it'll garner a lot more attention so at this point of time in India, yes, winning is important, but getting more attention towards women's uh, cricket is, is perhaps even more important in the larger scheme of things, which seems to be happening. But they need a coach, Charu, don't they? They've got a, an interim coach uh, yeah. at, the more, at the moment, uh, Rishikesh Kant Kantaka. Can he make a, a realistic <laughs> impact? Uh, yeah, Kanetkar. But, you know, he's, he's a... He's been in the coaching firm for quite a while now, but to have anything on a temporary basis is a bit of a problem. In fact, strangely enough, W.E. Raman, who was the Indian women's coach, was commentating on the match and he was there doing all the interviews and stuff. So he must be wondering, why am I not back here as a women's coach? So I don't know what ails the appointment of a permanent coach. I just think it's a little 
disrespectful to not have a permanent coach and a permanent set of support staff for the Indian women's team because Harman Preet Kaur obviously has taken uh, fairly strong control of the team. Now, I've always said that the higher the quality of a team in that the major international team, the best players in the world, how much can a coach influence them anyway? Maybe 3 to 5%. But with the women's game still growing, if I can use that term, still maturing, maybe the need for a permanent coach is uh, that much more important for the women than it is for the men. So yes, they need a little bit of help there. Kanitka is a fine guy, but whoever it is needs to be appointed on a more long-term, more sustainable basis so that everybody gets used to each other. You just wonder what the women's IPL will do for the women's game. It should be the most significant evolutionary step in the game's history for its potential to pay the players the sorts of sums that former players would never, ever have imagined and to where the game could go commercially. But it comes back to that point of investing in it in order to then raise it upwards. Yeah, it's time has come. I mean, it's been a long time coming. We've been talking about it on Stumped for years now about when it's likely to happen. I'm so glad that it is scheduled for March. Uh, although, mind you, there's still all sorts of little question marks because the teams haven't been announced yet. I think there's a tender out for uh, team ownership. And then, of course, there's a, a player distribution uh, mechanism, perhaps an auction or whatever else. All that still has to be planned. And you're wanting to begin on the 3rd of March. So that's a little myopic because everything needs time to be organized really well. But I suppose the BCCI will pull it off. Great news, of course, to have that happen. I'm not so sure about the commercial circles just yet. Uh, we'll see as time goes on in terms of the amount of money that needs to be spent on players or or the player purse and so on and so forth. But whatever the situation, the important thing was for it to start. And I, you know, can you imagine the excitement among the women cricketers of India? Because now it's it's like the men uh, situation was say 15 years ago. It's not just the top 15, 18, 20 women who are going to be in the limelight. It's going to be exploding to about a hundred or more, and it couldn't be better news for women's cricket in India, uh, about the the, uh, the women's IPL itself in terms of its viewership and ratings and commercial circles, all that we'll see. But the first step is always the most difficult. And that apparently, or uh, according to or, uh, what we all know, has been taken. Yeah, it is happening. Opportunity knocks. Now that is all we've got time for on this week's Stump then. My thanks to Jim Maxwell and Shari Sharma and of course to all of you. And we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.